Hello and welcome to the project management tutorial. In today's tutorial, we are going to talk about some of the basic aspects about the project management. I'm sure you must have few questions like what is a project? What is project management? What are some of the advantages of project management? What skills are required for project manager? Project management phases, project knowledge areas and processes, and of course, some of the PM methodologies. So in today's session, we are going to talk about all these agenda items one by one. And I welcome you all to the session and thank you for signing off for the project management tutorials today. So with this, let's get started with the first part, which is what is a project? I'm sure you will agree and you must have read it that project is nothing but a temporary endeavor that we have undertaken or that we undertake in order to achieve a output and that particular output is nothing but a product or a service or we get some result by the end of that project so project will definitely have a fixed timelines so whenever you undertake any project you will have a fixed start date and a fixed end date i still remember during my early experience into project management i was working on a market research project for one of the pharmaceutical companies so the project was conducted in a particular region and with a course team of people going into the market collecting the data so that project was spread across for six months so it had a start date and end date and of course it had a predefined objective so project always have some timelines associated with it apart from that project will always consume certain resources now when we talk about resources on project the project will consume resources not just about the human resources that we talk about here but also the other material resources or for that matter any other resources that are associated with the project it could be even for that matter the money it could be the human resources it could be material resources depending upon the type of project the kind of project that you're working on the resources will be involved for example in this case on our project of course we've had a team of six people working on the market research project so definitely material resources were involved as well as the human resources were involved apart from that there was also involvement of the money so budget was associated with for those six people to travel across multiple locations within the region and reach out to different target audience in order to gather the data so that is just one small example project also uses certain tools because project involves n number of activities in order to perform those activities it's important for us to use certain tools at times it depends on the complexity of the project as well as the presence of the team across regions if you have team members spread across regions then it's also very very important for us to use certain tools which will help us in collaboration of these team members so there are certain special tools and techniques that are required to be used on the project if the project is small if the team is small even i have seen projects are performed by using simple tool like microsoft excel or for that matter we can also use certain templates can be created even on the microsoft word and of course we can use email as one of the media to communicate apart from of course the most important communication should be the verbal communication so we need to use definitely certain tools but if we talk about a complex project then definitely a lot of things needs to be also involved into executing a complex project because number of activities will be more number of stakeholders will be more and that project could be a part of some program in turn some portfolio and it is strategically aligned to the organizational objective so considering that it's important to then use the relevant tools in order to be more effective and more efficient as well obviously when you will execute the project you will always have team of people working with you now when we talk about team of people working on a project we talk about a team which is truly a cross functional team i don't expect only people from the same function to be a part of the project obviously like if you are working on an it project and you are forming a team obviously you would need people who can perform various activities as a part of that project so you will have people who can do the analysis who can work on requirements who can do the system analysis who can do coding testing deployment 
so all these functions needs to be integrated and then we need to form a team which is truly a diverse team which is truly a cross functional team which will help you in fulfilling and completing all the project activities whatever is relevant based on the kind of project that you're working on so definitely to summarize if you talk about a project as i mentioned project will always have certain timelines a start date and an end date project will consume resources material resources human resources and the other resources project will use certain tools depending on the complexity of the projects and number of people involved and obviously project is executed with team of people and even with different stakeholders so if you talk about projects why do project get started and i'm sure that was the question which was i can see here in the question panel put up by ram that what are some of the reasons in order to initiate any project activity or why should we be initiating any project activity so thanks ram in fact for asking that question so let's understand some of these reasons one reason could be demand in market as i gave you example of the market research project so it could be decided that to a certain to analyze the demand in a particular market and once you analyze the demand in a particular market then you would launch a product so the example that i was quoting was basically a market research project that was undertaken for a pharmaceutical company so that they can launch a pharmaceutical product into that market so team of people was basically working in that region in order to ascertain in order to analyze the demand for a particular pharmaceutical product and once there is a demand then obviously you would go ahead and launch that product into that market so project could get initiated as a result of demand in the market sometimes you would manufacture certain products because the demand for that product is increasing in the market for example it could be the in automobile markets you may have come across the cars which are more affordable in the range of anywhere between 2 to 5 lakhs so certainly you will find that the market for such a cars is rising reason is obviously the demand for these small vehicles these hatchback vehicles is certainly increasing as a result of which you may undertake a project to manufacture or to come up with or to launch a new car altogether in the market it could be a strategic opportunity as well so you could strategically decide at a company level you may be working in a healthcare sector and now you want to expand into pharmaceutical sector and launch certain pharmaceutical products in the market so you could seek that as an strategic opportunity as well and put money and obviously then you would convert that resource into something which is tangible and you will tap that opportunity in the market so you are basically entering into a completely new line of business and that was the strategic decision that you have taken it could be due to the customer requirements typically you will find in it projects once you launch a certain applications and once customers start using that applications you will get lot of request in order to enhance that application based on the current usage and then you undertake enhancement projects and those enhancement projects are essentially conducted or essentially completed or done so that we can incorporate those features which have come as a result of customer requirements so those are like additional requirements that customer would like to see in the current product projects are also undertaken if there is any change in technology or if there is any advancement in the technology and you may have seen it a lot like typically in it project i have seen teams they changing the entire technical landscape from one technology architecture to the other technology architecture maybe because then it becomes much more easy to maintain it becomes easy to scale it becomes easy to stabilize like i have seen many projects are moving on to cloud based platform or projects using the analytics or projects which are undertaken so that they can move to the new technology which is more intuitive to use so technology advancement could be also another reason why projects are undertaken or it could be legal requirement i worked on many projects which were initiated as a result of the legal requirement compliance requirement like there was a project we were basically working on certain reports to be furnished as a bank to the regulators and those reports needs to be furnished every year 
every six months, every month, every quarter. So the project was initiated in order to create an application through which we can gather all the data from the input systems and analyze the data, create the reports, and then submit it to the regulators. So project could be also initiated as a result of some legal requirements. These are some of the reasons definitely why do we initiate the projects. Now why project ends? As we discussed earlier in the previous slide that projects will always have a start date and end date. So why would project end? Certainly a couple of reasons you would find here. One is of course project objectives are achieved. So for example, if I have undertaken that project for some legal requirement, now I have completed that project, it's launched, and that legal requirement was only for one time or maybe twice in a year, and now it's no more required. So that means that particular project's objective is achieved. Now we can end that project. Or objective won't be or can't be met. Sometimes I have seen projects are initiated, but they are like scrapped in the middle itself because those are no more required. The objective is sort of maybe challenged by the organization. It could be obsolete. It's no more required. You could come across such a scenarios as well. I came across very big program wherein it was aspirational program in one of the big and a complex organization. The idea was to integrate many applications together and see everything at one place. It started. But the scale of the program was so high that it couldn't sustain longer and that whole program had to be stopped. So even though we started with some vision, but we couldn't achieve that and uh, precisely due to which we had to really stop working on the programs. So you'll find you will, you will come across such a reasons why sometimes we need to just stop working on a particular project. The another confusion that people might have is to understand the difference between project and some of the operation activities. Let's quickly take a look at the difference between projects and operations. So some of these things we have already covered, like projects are temporary. It has a start date, it has ended. So it's a temporary endeavor, which is undertaken, as I mentioned, in order to produce some product result or to provide some service. Projects have defined start date and ended. That's another thing which we already spoke about. Tasks are unique to a project. So every project outcome that we get is a unique. So when you undertake a project, you are basically creating an outcome which is a unique product, a unique service or some unique result that you're producing by the end of that project. Project is also undertaken in order to have achieved a unique goal. So there should be some unique goal which is actually drafted in the beginning of project. It's predefined. As I mentioned, the goal could be to identify the potential in the market. Goal could be to fulfill the compliance or a regulatory requirement of a bank for which you have undertaken a project. So you will always have some predefined goal and then you undertake project based on that goal. So these are typical characteristic of a project. So when we undertake a project, you will definitely be able to relate some of these characteristics to those projects. However, if you look at the operation activities, they are completely different. The operation activities are more routine in nature. Those are more ongoing activities and the processes that needs to be performed. And mostly they're repetitive, they're cyclical. You will have to perform those activities maybe every week or every month or you know every year sort of that. Those are cyclical activities. And the whole objective of undertaking or doing the operational activities is to sustain in the market, is to sustain the business. Let's take a quick example. You are working on IT application or IT product. Now you've created that product and you launched it in the market. So once you launch in the market, people start using it. Customers start using it. And then you will have to also kick off the operations activities so that you can start supporting the product which is being used by your customers. And then your operation activities will begin. When customers start using the product, I'm sure they might come across certain incidences you know they might come across certain issues they might come across certain problems while using the product then they will raise those problems those issues as an incident and it will be assigned to you to the operations team and then it's investigated and then it's fixed so those are like operation related activities which are going to be part of the product once the product is launched then the operation activities will begin However, project activities will stop once you accomplish a project 
to launch that IT product. So then project is ended. What will start is the operation activities. So key here is to make sure that there is a proper handover between the project activities and the operation activities. And therefore, you will find that the operations team work very, very closely towards the end of the project. Not only that, these days we ensure that the operation activities or operation team members or operation team is involved very early in the project activity itself so that they would know what project are we working on and what product are we creating. So both the activities are certainly important project as well as operations, but they certainly differ in terms of why they are performed as well as the certain characteristics that they possess. From there, let's move on to project management. I'm sure you must have questions. What is project management? We saw what is project. We saw the difference between project and operations. Project management is nothing but application of the processes, methods, knowledge, skills, your experience to achieve objective of unique project, whatever the project that you're working on. So once you start applying that knowledge, then that particular process is called as project management. So possessing that knowledge is not certainly enough. You may be PMP certified or you may be aspiring to become a PMP certified or for that matter, you may have experience of 10 years or 15 years and you have gained quite a lot of knowledge over the period of time. But if you are not applying that knowledge, then it's of no any use. And that's where the project management comes into picture because it, it gives you some framework in order to apply that knowledge effectively and that will then gives us a lot of benefits, which we are going to talk about very soon. So it helps in properly carrying out all processes that are involved, starting from the conception till the completion of project. Any project when you undertake, if you're developing a product for the market and you are undertaking a project to manufacture that product or to come up with that new product, then obviously you'll have to conceptualize the idea. So you may be doing your hypothesis testing. You may be doing your uh, idea generations. You may be doing your finalization of the ideas. So you are basically conceptualizing about that product. You're trying to come up with some concept, some idea. So from there till the time you complete the project successfully, all these gamut of activities are carried out with n number of processes. And this requires you to know about how to perform project management. And then once you start understanding that and once you start applying that knowledge then that whole thing will then becomes a project management there are six p's of project management i'm sure you may be aware that we also say the six p's of presentation so similarly there are six p's of project management so proper planning prevents poor project performance many of you will agree with me that planning is one of the most important stage in project now planning could be done upfront the whole project planning could be done upfront or it could also be done in adaptive fashion planning is also done in a rolling wave fashion so there are different ways to do the planning definitely traditionally people used to do planning upfront and they used to try to stick to that plan but these days with agile and with a lot of changes that happen on the project it makes all the more sense for us to do the adaptive planning so we have to do adaptive planning and we have to do upfront planning as well. So that proper mix of it is certainly very, very important. But many times I have seen that people mentioning that planning is a waste of time. But trust me, when you do the planning properly, you will actually save time when you go ahead with your project. So make sure that you have a proper plan in place and all the stakeholders are aware about that plan. It's very well communicated. It's thoroughly reviewed and it's approved by the sponsor and the key stakeholders and I'm sure that will certainly help you in preventing the poor performance because once you have a plan then you'll be able to do the monitoring and controlling activities effectively but if you don't have a plan then what are you going to monitor on the project so it's very important and crucial for any project manager to make sure that there is a plan available on project that the person is working on let's move ahead and talk about the another aspect on the project so many times you'll find that you must have heard about this word constraint a lot on project so traditionally we used to talk about these four constraints it started with triple constraint 
and we we talk about now the four constraints but i actually add a few more let's talk about what are those a bit later but for now let's talk about uh, these four constraints that you see here now what is a constraint constraint is nothing but if you change one thing at least one other thing will get affected so for example time so as we saw just now that project has a fixed start date and a fixed end date so there is some duration through which we execute that project but what about the duration if it gets affected if the duration has been reduced suddenly what will happen so if there is change in time or schedule obviously at least one other constraint of the project will get affected your cost might go up because you will have to put more people or your quality will get affected because now you have less time to deliver more or you will not be able to complete all the scope which is being agreed with your customer so constraint is nothing but if one constraint changed then at least one other will get affected so we started with these four constraints triple constraints initially and then we've added one more so time scope and cost was there we've added quality as well but if you actually see there are a few other constraints as well on the project which we should be aware about and that's nothing but the expectations so if you see the project management diamond so we started with triple constraints on project and now we talk about diamond and i would also prefer to add a few more here so one of the thing could be risk risk is also a constraint so for example if your budget is reduced and the scope items are the same then obviously risk will go up because you will not have the budget left to take care of the risk on project so risk is another constraint that we talk about apart from that resources is also a constraint if you don't get enough resources to work on project then obviously you may not be able to complete all the scope item or you may not be able to work efficiently in order to achieve your project within schedule so resource could be another constraint as well we can look at so it's time cost quality scope resource risk and i also look at customer satisfaction as one of the constraint as well because customer satisfaction is not achieved if you'll not be able to deliver project within schedule and within budget so it's very important for us to also make sure that we achieve the customer satisfaction so if any of these constraints are not achieved then obviously your customers will not be happy and therefore it's important to also look at customer satisfaction as one of the constraints so if you ask me how effective is the project manager i would judge i would rather see how effectively the project manager is managing the constraints of the project and based on which the effectiveness of the project manager would easily be determined all right so with this now let's move on to advantages of the project management there are certain advantages of the project management and we'll talk through some of those advantages to begin with when you will do the project management in a proper way by proper planning by following the proper phases by following proper processes etc you will certainly get these advantages the first one is better efficiency when you will work by using the proper framework of the project you will be able to produce the outcome with better efficiency that means you know how to effectively use the resources of the project and how to optimally utilize those resources in order to get better outcome and more outcome that means your efficiency will certainly go up because you have done the proper planning you have planned for the resource utilization properly and that is what is covered as a part of the project management so project management will in turn help you in enhancing efficiency if it is a construction project and if you are utilizing certain machineries and if you do not have proper plan in place to utilize those machineries when and how and how much then obviously you will not be able to optimally utilize that but you will be able to utilize those machineries and have a better efficiency on the project provided that you have a better plan and provided that you are executing it effectively and you know how this whole project management activities works so certainly better project management will help in better efficiency gain as well it will help in improved customer satisfaction needless to say as i mentioned just now that if you are able to manage the project constraints effectively imagine if i am a project manager and if i managed everything effectively in terms of the scope of project i delivered what my customer was looking for i delivered that within the schedule i delivered that within the scope 
the quality was not compromised that means my customer got what he or she was looking for so if i managed all these constraints effectively then obviously there will be a better customer satisfaction as well ultimately customers will be happy when they get what they're looking for and when they get that within time within budget and the risks are effectively managed on the projects as well there will be enhanced efficacy as well so efficacy we talk about effectiveness when you are applying the project management principles and processes i'm sure you'll be able to work effectively on the project so effectiveness is what you will be able to enhance by having the better project management application of knowledge skills processes principles etc so if you talk about effectiveness you know what exactly does that mean to you so whatever you're doing you'll be able to do that effectively on the project because you know how to do that because you have a framework with you because you have created a plan because you know how to for example monitor budget so your effectiveness will be better when you have created a proper plan and you have also been able to monitor your budget properly you are using certain tools for that and you are tracking the actual expenses you are also using certain tools like for example the cost performance index the schedule performance index etc in order to take preventive and the corrective decisions based on how your indexes are performing so obviously your effectiveness of executing the project will also go up better teamwork because you have a framework in place you'll be able to mobilize resources effectively and uh, you'll be able to achieve what's the goal of the project because what will happen as a result of having a, everything documented you'll be able to align the goal of each and every team member to the ultimate goal of the project so if the goal of the project is to manufacture a car which is costing less than a lakh rupees then obviously you'll be able to align the goal of each and every team member working on that project to that ultimate vision and the goal that you have seen for yourself so you'll have a better team team work as well greater competitive advantage so the biggest advantage with effective project management is that you'll be able to produce what you are producing much earlier than your competition because you are controlling your activities well and that will certainly give you a competitive edge and if you go to the market early obviously you'll be able to tap market early if you take example of let's say research and development projects and i have seen research and development projects they goes year on year they are very long duration projects but the key is how can we complete that project early by effectively using project management practices and launch that product as early as possible in the market so that you can reap on the benefit of being early in the market so for that obviously project management practices will help us service expansion you'll be able to expand your services into various areas as well by effective project management increased flexibility what will happen by better planning you'll be able to also have proper buffers in place you'll be able to also bring in that flexibility in the plan in place so that if there is any change you'll be able to accommodate that change so you can offer that better flexibility to your customers by doing the better project management risk management will be done much much better way because you will have a risk register you will have risk owners you have done the qualitative risk analysis quantitative risk analysis you are able to prioritize the risk you are able to calculate the monetary value of the risk and associate the budgets if required to the risk you will be able to decide the risk response strategies when to transfer the risk when to avoid risk when to accept it etc so you'll be able to do risk management effectively quality will be enhanced it will be improved so when you will do project management obviously the outcome that you're producing whatever the product result or that process that you're producing will be able to deliver what your customer is looking for most importantly it will be fit for the purpose whatever the purpose for which you have designed or you are creating that outcome i'm sure it will be definitely be able to meet the quality expectation of the customers so from there we now move on to the next important part which is understanding what skills are required for project manager if project managers will have to effectively implement the project management processes then what are some of the skills that the project manager should possess the most important one definitely is communication 
over 90% of the time, you'll find project manager communicating through some tools. It could be just by sending emails. It could be push communication, pull communication. It could be status reports. It could be attending meetings, communicating about the risks, prioritization, negotiating, of course, collaborating with the stakeholders. So communication is certainly very, very important skill that is required in a project manager. Another thing is, of course, leadership. Now, whichever the structure that you have in your organization, be it a metric structure or be it a typical hierarchical structure that we see or a functional structure, you will always have leadership is definitely, definitely required. So even your team members who are working on your project with you, whether they report you or not, but still you need a leadership. Leadership doesn't mean that you need to have always a reportee and then only you'll be a leader. No, everybody can be a leader in themselves because we need to influence other people, right? So you need to inspire them to perform, to do the job. And for that, we need certainly a leadership. You need to direct them. You need to also ensure that everybody's vision is ultimately aligned to the product vision or the project vision that you're working on. Team management, effective team management is important. So project manager should be a people person so that he should be able to empathize with the team effectively. He should be able to understand what team needs. These days, for example, we talk about servant leadership. So we expect the project manager to be a servant leader to the team so that whatever the team needs, and if that is required to be there, obviously the project manager is the one who is supporting the team in getting necessary resources at the right time. Negotiation skill is very important because you're negotiating with your stakeholders, you're negotiating with your customers, you're negotiating with your team. So everybody, it's really important to have a good negotiation skill so that you'll be able to create a win-win situation. It shouldn't happen that you're too submissive or you're too aggressive. You'll be assertive and whatever the decisions that you're taking, ultimately, they are helping and they are basically supporting in achieving the project goals and the objectives. Personal organization. So that's another important thing. You should be able to also understand as a project manager, you should be able to understand yourself well. You should be able to have a emotional intelligence, right? You should be able to manage risk effectively. At the same time, you should be a good risk manager. Some of the points I just now mentioned about risk management as well. Now, these skills are certainly required from the soft side. And from the hard skill side, obviously, you need to have the relevant domain knowledge, technology knowledge. So that will be an added advantage, even if it is not mandatory. But if you have the relevant domain knowledge and technology knowledge, that will give you certainly an edge over others when you are discussing, when you are solving problems, when you're interacting with your stakeholders, etc. OK. So I think some of you were asking me about the project phases. I suppose yeah, I can see John was asking about the project phases. So initially I was kind of not tempted to answer that question at that point in time because I knew it's going to come. So John, this is where we're going to talk about now the different project phases. So let's undergo. Let's just quickly understand about the various project phases. Whenever we undertake a project, obviously we'll have to execute the project in a structured manner and to bring in that structure what will also help us is the project management phases so we begin with the initiation activities once we are clear with that we do a planning once our plan is approved we start working on the plan we execute through it while plan is under execution it's important to continuously monitor and control and once all the key activities are performed then we need to close the project phase so these are the typical phases, but your project phases could also depend on your domain you're working in. For example, if you're working in research and development, your phases could be a bit different. If you're working in software, then your phases could be a bit different, like typical SDLC or software development lifecycle as we talk about. So we begin by you know initiation, then we have got requirements gathering, we have design. Before design, we do analysis. And then after design, then we do coding, testing, etc so those are the typical phases that we talk about if it is agile then it's totally different we do in an iterative and uh, incremental fashion you may be following scrum or you may be following some other scaled agile framework etc so phases could differ which is fine whichever the phases that you decide and agree upon within your organization 
or within your team that should be fine as long as everybody is aware about what are those phases and what are some of the key milestones that we're going to achieve by the end of the phase for example initiation phase is where basically a decision making will happen so this is where we identify a project to work upon and we do some of the initial activities as a part of this phase of course we'll talk about some of these activities a bit later as well during planning essentially what is done is we basically create a plan we create a plan not only the point of view of the activities the milestones but also we see to it that how are we going to stick around the budget stick around the schedule etc so all of that we factor in and then we start executing it and that's where we break down the scope items into tasks and then we start picking up the task and we start executing those tasks then comes monitoring and controlling phase and this is where we just compare it with the plan that we have created so if it is a one year project and if you are already in third month then we compare it with the plan so by third month where we should be ideally and where we are so if there is any gaps then we try to identify that and then we take corrective actions closing phase is where we basically essentially we close some of the project activities that we are uh, working on when i said some of the project activities in the sense some activities where we may have involved vendors some activities may have been you know done by some third party so we need to identify everything all the activities that we need to close and then formally we also do the contract closing etc let's get on to it in fact and let's just go through one by one and try to see what are some of the key activities that we perform as a part of each of these phases so starting with initiation phase so as you can see on the screen the first thing is of course well defined scope statement as a part of the initiation phase we need to first understand what am i supposed to working on so if you are working on a project wherein you are producing some it product and that it product is let's say for digitizing the customer experience so let's say it's a bank and you're working on a digital project wherein uh, whoever comes to a branch they have to fill out the application form and uh, you want to convert that application form into the digital experience wherein it's not only going to save your paper but also your customers doesn't have to visit the branch and they can just uh, fill out this application form and submit it by sitting at their home so it's basically nothing but digitizing the whole experience to the customer so what's the actual scope statement so we are providing the digital experience to the customer so that we are going and we are moving towards the paperless banking and we are trying to capitalize on the technology that's available today so you are understanding the scope statement very well what is expected which forms this to be digitized is it just the home loan personal loan forms or are we also digitizing some other forms that customer needs to furnish or submit it and then we identify the stakeholders so who are my stakeholders okay so it depends on again if it is a multinational bank then obviously it's going to be different than if it is the bank which is operating only within one country so depending upon whether the project is a regional project it's a national project or it's done globally based on that your stakeholder list may vary you need to start working on that then we'll have to ensure the resource availability now once you understand the scope of work if you have decided that even if it is a global project but you would like to do the pilot in a particular region and once that pilot is successful then you will roll it out across if that is the understanding then obviously resource availability would be accordingly taken care of or would be accordingly placed now as a part of the initiation phase what's also important is uh, to have a proper goal what is my goal ultimately now goal there are several ways through which we we write a goal and we always say that goal should be smart not only it should be smart but also it should be clear now many of you may have already heard about smart goal it should be specific measurable attainable or achievable it should be realistic it should be time bound or it should be timely similarly when you work on a goal it should also be collaborative it shouldn't happen that there is goal but you know people can't really relate to that we should be able to get along everybody all the team limited emotional appreciable refinable let's take a couple of examples so that we'll be able to relate it to this now there are certain examples here these are like bit specific examples to increase the net income by 10% by the end of third quarter 2018 for example so by this goal i would get a better clarity in terms of what is the expectation 
So in this goal, it's very clearly mentioned that we have to focus on increasing the net income by how much is by 10% by when is by the third quarter by which year is 2018. So we could be a bit more specific over here, right? The other example could be to decrease auto claims cycle time from an average 12 days to 8 days by the March 31st 2000 maybe 19. So this is another good example wherein we are very clear about what do we want to achieve by the end of that project. So if you want to reduce the cycle time but cycle time by how many days and by when do we want to reduce the cycle time etc. So if the goal is clear and smart then it becomes much more easier to relate to like as we say clear C is for collaborative so it should encourage your employees to work together in a collaborative fashion. So if I know if there is a clarity that I have to increase income by 10% then I believe this will give a lot of you know insights for the people to why we should be working collaboratively because there is a goal we can relate to that there is a good clarity over there limited goal should be limited in both scope and duration. So here also as you see scope is very clear you know they want to just reduce the cycle time okay so scope is definitely very very clear and limited and there is also a duration attached to that it should be emotional so people should be able to establish the emotional connection and that will also help us in capitalizing on the employees energy and passion with which they work so emotional angle is equally important here appreciable large goals should be broken down into smaller ones so if you come across any goal which is complex and which is large maybe you would like to break it down into the smaller goals as i was mentioning sometimes ago about digitizing the entire banking experience but that's a very big vision so if you just start applying or if you just start executing or start working on this it will be very difficult to execute but if you just break it down that i want to digitize the customer experience for the retail banking so all the retail banking customers who comes to the branch and visit the branch and may fill out certain forms in a physical way. Now I would like to use maybe the tablet or maybe some maybe the computers by putting up there in the branches so that people can come and fill up that I can save on paper and it will also give a lot of convenience because same thing could be done even by sitting at home. So I'm trying to break off some of the complex things into bit simpler ones which are easy to execute and uh, analyze. It should be uh, refinable that means set goal with headstrong and steadfast objective. So it's very important for us to ensure that if required I should be able to refine my goal. I should be able to change my goal. I should be able to amend it you know modify it. If something which we can't amend or modify then it's very difficult to stick around so that's another characteristics of uh, the good written goal is what we talk about so we just now spoke about the phases as a part of planning of course we talk about uh, all of these things the goals will come as a part of the planning so once we have initiation activities once we have got the clearly defined scope and then we get into the planning and that's where we agree to what exactly we want to achieve and by when do we want to achieve and we have got everything documented in the form of plan and then we start executing it and this is where your actual team will come into picture because now it's time for us to start working on some of the key tasks as part of the plan that we've all agreed to execute then we have to do assignment of the task to the resources so we have got resources we'll assign the task to the resources and they will then start executing those tasks at times we might need to also reach out to some of the other enterprise teams the enterprise teams could be a procurement team, it could be a finance team, it could be a human resource team. And why do we need to reach out to them? Is because if I want to procure something on the project, I can reach out to the procurement team, the finance team, and you know try to procure things for uh, my project. In the digital project example, I might need to procure. Maybe I need to onboard certain vendors because it's going to be a new experience to me, and I don't have that expertise. I would like to onboard few vendors who can provide us that expertise. It could be even the new technology. So I want to explore the new technology. It could be Google Cloud or it could be the Amazon Cloud or it could be even for that matter the Azure platform which is another from Microsoft. So it depends on what exactly I would like to 
do. So for that, I need to also engage the procurement. And, and then what's most important is uh, as a project manager, I should be able to direct my team. I should be able to manage the execution effectively by continuous monitoring. And that's where your tracking system will come into picture. These days, I have seen mostly we use tools. So it could be MS projects or it could be clarity from CA or it could be even simple Excel sheet or it could be if it is agile project, then you could be using certain workflow management tools, Jira or for that matter, you know, whichever the tool version one rally, etc., which you would be using. And that's where the task assignments will come into picture. The continuous tracking will come into picture because these tools will actually help you in continuously tracking as well. On an ongoing basis, we'll have to also organize certain status meetings. Now, those status meetings could be organized with the team on a weekly basis and maybe again with the at a program level, at a portfolio level, it could be done at a fortnightly basis. Maybe initially the frequency could be more, but as we go ahead, it could even reduce. And then we'll have to also, based on the progress, go on updating the project schedule. And if required, we need to also modify the plan. So your plan should be flexible enough to be able to amend it as per the current progress. So that's where we need to also engage some of the stakeholders. You might need to take certain approvals in order to amend your plans or update your plans. Moving to the next phase, which talks about monitoring and controlling. And uh, this is where some of the key metrics will come into picture. And these are the key performance indicators or KPIs as we talk about from the point of view of project objectives. So are we really close to achieving the project objectives or not? So is the digitization happening in the retail banking now with maybe the, those five forms or those 10 forms that we identified or not? What is the quality deliverables? So are we meeting the quality standards? So if it is the IT projects and you're working on the applications, what about the defects? Are we identifying defects and how frequently are we identifying defects during the development cycle? So is it being identified during the development or is it being identified at a later stage during testing phase or the unit testing phase or user acceptance testing phase? So even that will certainly matter a lot. Cost tracking. So you would also need to do the cost tracking on a regular basis. So this is where you will be able to also use some of the techniques like earned value management or EVM. So you will come up with the schedule performance index, cost performance index, and will be able to manage the cost and schedule, right? And effort tracking. So again, how much effort was committed by the team members and how much effort is actually booked on the project. So even certain tools can be used in order to track the efforts on the project. And of course, the performance of the project. So overall, how are we faring with respect to the budget, with respect to the schedule, with respect to the risks that are there on the project, the issue handling. So all of these aspects will certainly be looked into when it comes to measuring and monitoring the key performance uh, indicators. Then we move to the last phase, which is a closing phase. And this is a phase where we, of course, we make sure that whatever we produced is verified by the customer and is agreed is accepted by the customer because each of the requirement that we work on will always have some acceptance criteria so we'll have to ensure that the customer is involved into proper verification and once it is verified you know that means we are good good to go ahead and close the project then we'll have to also look out for uh, if there is any contract with any of the vendors so how can we close those contracts based on the terms and conditions that we agreed and some other activities with respect to project closure needs to be performed, like completing certain documents, arranging the PIR, which is a post implementation review. So some of those activities would also be a part of your typical project closure activities that we do. So these are just high level activities, but we of course perform a lot of processes as a part of uh, some of these phases and we'll go through them at a very high level today. So I hope this is clear to you all, all right? So I can see some of you are uh, already giving your hands up. So thank you for that. Then let's move on to the knowledge area and processes. Now, since you all are aspired to become the certified project managers by completing your PMP certification successfully. So it's important to learn about knowledge areas and the processes that are being 
put up or that are being published through PIMBOK, which is official guide by the PMI. So in PIMBOK, you'll find there are 10 different knowledge areas and there are 49 different processes. So if you count these processes, there are 49 of them and there are 10 knowledge areas. And of course, there are process groups. So those process groups will be your initiating, your planning, executing, monitoring and controlling, closing. So these are the process groups and all these knowledge areas and processes, they are actually going to be a part of these uh, process groups and the knowledge areas. So maybe I would like to just very quickly show you this. Uh, this is where all of uh, the process groups and uh, the processes will come into picture. So there are total 49 of them, as I mentioned, and there are 10 knowledge areas and these are the process groups. And you'll find each of these process groups and the knowledge areas, there are various processes which are cut across into multiple knowledge areas from each of these uh, process groups. Okay, so let's take a look at this very quickly. We'll not be able to really go through this in detail. Of course, we have limited time, but certainly we'll be able to just take a glance of some of these knowledge areas and processes. So let's start with the integration. So project integration is one of the biggest knowledge areas because this is where we perform some of the key activities like developing a project charter because project charter empowers the project manager. So it's important to have a project charter in place. We start working on the project management plan because project management plan will also contains a lot of other subsidiary management plan from scope point of view, schedule point of view, quality point of view, risk point of view. So that's another important one. Then once we have a plan in place, we start executing the plan. And uh, that is where the directing and managing project work will come into picture because this is the process wherein we start executing the plan that we have agreed. And once we are into execution, it's important to continuously monitor and control some of the project work. Why control is required? Because if we are deviating from the plan, then we need to obviously take corrective actions. So if you are overspending, then we need to see how we can reduce the spend by taking certain corrective actions. Perform integrated change control. While working on project, you will also be given a lot of other things than you agreed initially in the form of scope. And those things or those changes could be due to what's going on currently on the project based on the customer initial understanding of the overall progress or it could be involvement of the customer into maybe prototype reviews or demos, etc. So all that put together will certainly lead to certain new changes and how to manage that is covered as a part of this as well. And integration management will also cover closing the project activities. So as you can see here, integration management is a big piece because it cut across all the process groups. Then scope management. This is where we'll do the planning of scope management, how to collect requirements, how to define scope based on that, and then break down the scope items into smaller, smaller items as a part of the work breakdown structure, which is WBS. And once we have that in place, we need to also ensure that we validate scope, right? So we need to have that pressability in place so that what we are building is in line with what is being agreed between you and customer and how we can control the scope as well so that scope creep should not occur and uh, you have got a any change that comes in is managed effectively then moving to the time management so this is where we again start working on planning schedule management activities so once we have a schedule management plan so we then define the activities so activities are derived out of the scope items that we have worked upon once we have activities that you are going to perform on the project, you will have to sequence them, right? So without sequencing the activities, you would not be able to understand what needs to be done first, what needs to be done second, etc. So it's very important to sequence those activities. And then you will estimate for each of the activity how many resources are required, as well as you will estimate how long would that activity take. And then based on all this information, you'll come up with a schedule. And that's called as develop schedule process. And once we have a schedule in place, then what's important is to control that schedule. So all this happen as a part of the time management as a knowledge area. Moving to the cost management, this is where we learn about planning cost management. So of course we create a plan for that and then we go on estimating cost. So how do we estimate cost for each of these activities that we have listed down? How much would be the cost for that? So it could be the bottom up estimation that you could do and based on the cost that you have estimated for each of the activities, what you would then do is 
you'll determine the budget you will just rule it up you will calculate how much would it take and based on that you will determine the budget and then you will have to then control that budget once we have it in place the quality management will take care of the quality management plan whatever is being agreed between you and customer in terms of quality and whatever is your quality commitment needs to be captured over there and then we'll have to also perform certain processes like performing quality assurance activities so that it's like what you are building is a better quality so that's very important so quality assurance will make sure that you are building the quality in the product and then of course you will control quality so for example if it's a software project you will make sure that you will follow the coding standards so that the code quality is better you will follow techniques like refactoring so that you are removing the duplicate lines of code or unnecessary lines of code etc so all that will make sure that uh, what you're producing is a good quality code which is bare minimum required to execute that program and in turn end to end develop that uh, functionality human resource management will cover your uh, planning aspect first of creating a human resource management plan and of course the other things is how to acquire human resources on the project how we can develop them providing them training and then how we can manage them throughout so that we can retain them and obviously how we can make sure that people are happy on the project they are motivated etc communication management plan will talk about of course creating the plan in itself what to communicate when to communicate whom to communicate what to communicate and what's the media to communicate so is it going to be a meeting is it going to be an email is it going to be a push or pull communication so what are the communication channels that we are going to use so all this data will be captured there once we have the plan in place then we need to manage and control it effectively then comes the procurement management so this is where again we'll be able to come up with the procurement management plan up front and then we just execute that plan so what have you decided to outsource to the vendor how much of it and then which vendors so how to select them so all of that will come into picture then you start conducting the procurement activities and of course you will control it and once the project is over then you will do the closing of procurement which is nothing but contact closing risk is another important uh, knowledge area this is where we understand about uh, of course we create the risk management plan and then most importantly we upfront define how are you going to identify the risks how are we going to do qualitative and quantitative analysis of the risks again whatever is the organizational process assets as a part of that you may have already defined the quantitative and qualitative way of doing the risks analysis and there must have been some template already in the organization so the same template could be used here and then you do the risk response planning so for each of the risks that are identified you do the prioritization and then you do planning which risks you need to mitigate which risk you need to transfer which is you need to accept because there is mitigation could cost you more than accepting the risk and then periodically just go on reviewing that plan so that you can control risks effectively and the most important the last but the most important one is the stakeholder management this is where we capture about how are we going to identify stakeholders right and how are we going to manage the stakeholders effectively so different stakeholder management strategies needs to be captured over here in terms of stakeholder engagement from the point of view of power and interest right so from the point of view of influence of the stakeholder and how much is the power to the stakeholder etc so you create those grids and you try to control your stakeholders through those grids some stakeholders you need to manage closely some stakeholders you need to just keep them informed about what's happening all right so depending on the influence and the power of the stakeholder you need to take those decisions and then of course this way you should be able to control it so this cover all the 10 knowledge areas and 49 processes that we are going to study in detail as a part of the pmp certification training program so i'm sure you may have a lot of questions on these but don't worry all of those will get answered as a part of the training program that we're going through Okay, so this brings us to the next slide and this talks about methodologies. So what are some of the methodologies that we can think of in the project management? Since we are talking about the project management, you know, you need to have a proper governance in place, you need to have a proper processes in place. There are certain methodologies which actually helps us in ensuring that all this is being followed effectively. 
and uh, you will come across many of them now this is not really in ranking or anything of that sort this is just kind of a list so starting with agile because these days we talk about agile a lot because agile will certainly help in delivering better business value and uh, it will also help in identifying issues and defects very early in the cycle and then it in turn it gives a lot of opportunity and time for us to fix those defects and you know work through those so agile is definitely one of the most popular methodologies these days waterfall was there once upon a time and even it is still there it's not bad wherever things are clear upfront no changes are expected not too many changes are expected uh, feedback loops are not required too frequently i think even waterfall also gives you good results maybe provided that you know all these things are there but typically in software projects we have seen that many times we work on the complex adaptive systems and where things are like from technology point of view from requirements point of view there is a lot of uncertainty and that leads to a lot of changes being introduced in the project scrum is one of the agile methodologies and it's very very lightweight it's described only in 18 pages and scrum is such a methodology wherein it actually helps us in bringing in good governance you know within team because uh, it has got fixed uh, time boxed iterations as well as there are certain fixed ceremonies that we do so scrum is definitely one of the most popular agile methodologies and then we had rapid application development during early 90s it was uh, introduced in fact rapid application development involves or rad involves a lot of prototyping and taking early feedbacks and building on that so definitely it was very very effective at that point in time and in fact agile evolved out of rapid application development was definitely one of the inputs i would uh, say new product integration so again uh, how to integrate new product specific attention is given over there prince2 is another methodology again there is also a certification that's available for prince2 for those uh, who are interested so certainly that's also available so this talks about projects in a controlled environment it's another structured project management method right and uh, this will certainly give a lot of emphasis on managing and controlling the various project stages so there is a proper training on prince2 really so i don't think so right now we need to go through all of that kanban is another methodology within agile but kanban is definitely very old it was tried first time in toyota production system and from there it has become so much popular these days that it's used in even portfolio managements and even scaled agile frameworks and it's very simple yet very powerful methodology the whole objective of this methodology is to make things visible and you know create the flow of work and make it visible and and control the work in progress and that actually helps us in identifying the bottlenecks and you know try to reduce the cycle time or lead time etc six sigma is uh, definitely another methodology and uh, it's more statistical in nature it's heavily used in the industries where things are tangible we can measure it and apply the statistical tools and this way we'll be able to then understand the as is state and we can certainly move on to the to be state that could be enhancing the productivity or reducing cost or for that matter maybe the um, depending upon for example if it is a call center so how can we reduce the average call handling time etc so six sigma is definitely old and a popular one dmaic is one of the methodologies within six sigma which is define measure analyze improve and control so these are the phases within uh, dmac it's called as dmac cycle and when you follow six sigma project you actually implement dmac cycle so you would then understand how does this whole thing work and outcome mapping is another one so outcome map- mapping actually focuses a bit more on of course planning monitoring and evaluating some of these are important activities and mainly from the social change point of view this is where the outcome mapping would come into picture really so these are several of them methodologies which are available out in the you know available to all of us to use and of course each one of it has its own advantages and disadvantages so this covers everything that we're supposed to be talking about as a part of today's session so we started with what is project right from there what is project management we spoke about difference between project and operations we had gone through the advantages of doing the effective project management not only that we had also covered various project management phases 
and uh, most importantly from PMP certification point of view we also touched upon the 10 knowledge areas and various processes 49 processes within these knowledge areas and to close with we had just now covered the different different methodologies within the project management that we can adopt to I hope today's session was useful to you I wish you all the best and I'll see you all in the next session thank you I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to edureka channel to learn more happy learning